tonight, I'm very excited to uh, welcome Rashonda Tate, celebrating the release of The Queen of Sugar Hill, a novel of Hattie McDaniel, uh, which brings to life the powerful story of one woman who was driven by many passions, ambition, love, sex, family, friendship, and equality. In recreating Hattie's story, Rashonda delivers an unforgettable novel of resilience, dedication, and determination about what it takes to achieve your dreams, even when everything and everyone is against you. As a national best-selling author and award-winning journalist, Rashonda Tate has the credentials and the passion to bring stories to life. A highly sought-after motivational speaker and poet, Rashonda is a three-time nominee and previous winner of the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literature. She has received a plethora of distinguished awards and honors for her journal journalism, fiction, and poetry writing skills, including an introduction to the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame and the Texas Liter Literary Hall of Fame. Two of her novels have been made into television movies. Tate will be in conversation with Tiffany L. Warren, a novelist and screenwriter who has published over 30 full-length novels. Her book to film projects, Favorite Son, The Sound of Christmas, and Favorite Son Christmas are a hit with viewers and readers alike. Tiffany's latest project is a historical fiction novel with the first black uh, prima donna, Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, and the working title is The Black Swan, and um, that will hit our shelves in early 2025. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome to Politics and Prose, Rashonda Tate and Tiffany L. Warren. So Rashonda, I was just checking to see if this is on. I'm so excited to be talking to you about The Queen of Sugar Hill, a novel of Hattie McDaniel. You know, we've been together on this writing journey for decades. It, I hate to say decades because it makes me feel old, but we've been doing this for decades and this is new for you, historical fiction. So what made you choose Hattie's story as your first foray into historical fiction? So um, like so many people, I saw Gone with the Wind years ago. My grandmother, it was her favorite movie. So the first time I saw her watching it, I just remember having a visceral reaction to Hattie McDaniel. And over the years, I just did not like Hattie McDaniel. And my grandmother said, well, why not? And I said, well, she's, she's a maid and she's playing this stereotypical role. And my grandmother says, she's playing a maid. I am a maid. Mm. And why are you looking at her domestic duties with such disdain? Then she said, and what would you have her play? Should she play Scarlett O'Hara in 1939? Wow, right. And so it was at that point where my eyes were kind of opened. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I started writing in other fields, but I always had this affinity for Hattie McDaniel. And as I was looking at, tra at transitioning to another genre, she kept speaking to me. And I said, I have to take off my 21st century lens right. through which we see Hattie McDaniel and through which we judge her and really look at her for the, the legend that she was. And once I took off that lens, it made a world of difference. Mm. That is, that's so insightful and it's true when we see that that image of Hattie in her costume, especially right now, 2024, it can, you know, give you that visceral reaction. So it's 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 a good thing that you're shedding light on her story. So I heard some tea about you. I heard <laughs> this ain't that kind of signing. <laughs> some tea. I heard that in college you wanted to be the next Oprah. Um, so <laughs> How did this desire shape the choices you've made in your career? And um, what did you find out about yourself as you navigate these new historical fiction waters? It really was a matter of looking at things differently because, you know, a couple of years ago they had this whole cancel gone with the wind thing and, mm -hmm. and you know, cancel mammy. And I was among those, cancel it all. But we try so hard to, to, we come out against people that are trying to cancel our history. Right. But we have a tendency to do that with the ugly parts of our history. Mm -hmm. And I don't even want to say ugly because my grandmother wasn't, that wasn't an ugly part. We cancel out 
all of the domestic uh, um, parts of our past because we want to see something different. And so I have that affinity toward her. I also fancy myself an actress. So that's where there was that connection. Um, did y'all know I was in a movie? Thank you. See, um, I starred in Let the Church Say Amen. Starred. Okay, maybe I didn't star. Maybe I only had six lines, and maybe four of those got cut, but <laughs> I was in the movie. And so I really did. I, I loved... Um, Hattie McDaniel reminded me in so many ways of a quiet warrior. Mm -hmm. We're so used to activists who are loud and proud, right. and I like the fact that she was quietly making a difference, a quiet change agent. And that's something every one of us can be, right? A quiet change agent. But let's go back to this acting thing because, you know, Hattie McDaniel, if you guys didn't know, was the first African-American person to win an Oscar. So it's Oscar season now. And since Hattie was the first black person to win, what do you think she would think of this year's Oscar nominees? Well, she would be happy that there are two nominated uh, for Best Supporting Actress, which is Danielle Brooks for Sophia from Color Purple and uh, um, Devon Joy Randolph for um, The Holdovers. She would be sad that both of those women are nominated for domestic roles. Mm. Um, she would be sad that here we are 84 years after she won only to have our eighth, this would, if one of them win, that would make them the ninth winner. Wow. So in all of those years, we've only had nine black uh, w women win for Best Supporting Actress. We were just talking about this a little bit on, in the car on the way over, how Viola Davis, as amazing as an actress as she is, she also played a maid on the help. And so, you know, we definitely still have a ways to go. Um, and I think you're right. I think Hattie would be happy to see that there are folks nominated, but she would be like, okay. 84 years, y'all can get some better roles, some right. more roles, more diverse roles. And, you know, that's part of what she caught grief for. Yes. Was because she was just acting in the roles that she was allowed to act. So a lot of people didn't know that Hattie McDaniel was hated by both white people and black people. White people hated her because they felt Mammy was too sassy. Yes. Black people hated her because of the demeaning stereotypes. And she just wanted to act. And so I was always fascinated by her trying to just walk this path, this fine path, and find her place. Yeah, I just uh, earlier today read the scene where Hattie was answering all these letters from the soldiers. She had gone out on a tour um, during the war to help, you know, uplift them. And she gets all these letters and it's like hate mail. And I just, you know, it made me sad. A lot of what I read in the book made me sad for Hattie and the fact that she gets to be triumphant and have peace in your story is good too. Um, so speaking of all of the history that you put in here, for a person as famous as Hattie, there had to be an overwhelming amount of information. And, you know, I, I know this, trying to research for historical fiction, you can go down a rabbit hole looking for one bit of information. So how did you decide the pieces and parts of Hattie's story to tell? So I wanted to make sure, this is historical fiction, but I, the foundation of everything that I write is the histor historical part. Mm -hmm. It's all facts. The fiction comes in filling in the blanks. Right. And so I wanted to make sure that I stayed tr true to her story and the things that she had gone through, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what she, she went through. I had to tone, tone it down because it is you know, only three, 400 pages. So I, had to, I start at when she won the Academy Award instead of a cradle to the grave story. Gotcha. Okay, so you said you had to tone it down. What got left out? Oh, see. <laughs> Had it, it's juicy stuff in here, yes. so I want to know what she left out. So Hattie McDaniel, one of the things that um, I was surprised, Hattie McDaniel loved her some men, and the men loved her back. Yes, they did. And so I found myself doing a lot of research, and you know how you discover that your grandmother was, was doing the do, and you're like, I didn't need to know that. That's, <laughs> and that's how I felt about some of the things that I was uh, discovering about Hattie McDaniel. And one of the biggest things I had to do was Hattie had four husbands and then she had a lot of a lot of men that she w was with so much so that I was like, I can't keep track. I need a scorecard. So I can I condensed 
many of her men into one man. Okay. Um, just because I didn't want the reader trying to figure out, okay, who was this guy and who was this guy? So that that's where I took some liberties. And I explain all of that in the historical notes. Okay. So I love the feeling of old Hollywood in this novel. There is There are so many parties. Um, and it, it really made me you know, splicing between the sad parts to see her still having parties and partying her way through a lot of grief. Um, why did you think it was important to show that piece as well? So if you hear overall her story, you can feel like it's depressing mm -hmm. um, because she had a lot of grief, a lot of tragedy. But one of the things that I love the most was that she persevered in spite of all of the things that were thrown her way, all of the hate she got, she persevered. And so there were times where I would be researching and I would go, God, I, I just would be laying on the sofa crying. Mm -hmm. And she did have moments where she fell, but she always got up. She always got up. And that's, I feel like that's a theme for black people writ large, right? Yes. Getting back up. Um, so you talked to us about Hattie and her men, but you left out another little spicy <laughs> tidbit about Hattie that's in the book. So do you want to enlighten us? Yeah. So I, again, I'm, I'm writing historical fiction, so I am dealing in, in the truth. And part of her truth was after she had had so much bad luck with men, she decided to try her luck with women. Mm -hmm. And so I wrestled with, okay, do I want this? But then I said, that's her legacy. That's her legacy. Um, and then I wrote, um, I was fascinated. This was a rabbit hole I went down with the Sewing Circle. Um, the Sewing Circle was a group in Los Angeles, a group of women who were married to pro um, prominent men in Los Angeles. And they met up every um, so often for a sewing circle where they didn't sew. There were no needles and threads. Um, <laughs> this was where they would go and they would just exchange partners. This is 1940s. Wow. And I was, I was shocked with it. And, and I, I wanted to make sure that I included it because it was part of her story. And mm -hmm. so one of the big actresses that, um, to, uh, that she had a, an affair with was Tallulah Bankhead. And she was a popular, um, act, popular white actress, and that was one of one of the people Hattie was with. All right, well, go ahead, Hattie, because she was <laughs> flying her flag loud and proud in the 1940s. <laughs> okay, so my favorite scene, my absolute favorite scene in this book is when Hattie visited Howard University campus right here in D.C., and she gave the fur right off of her body to a young actress whose mother, or as a gift for her mother. Um, this spoke to me about Hattie's giving spirit and how she really liked to take young thespians under her wing. What is your favorite scene in the book? So that would probably be one. She was very, very giving, and I loved that she would do that, you know, she, in spite of all of the hate that she gave. All she wanted to do, as she said in her acceptance speech, was be a credit to her race. Absolutely. And so I wrote the scene at, at Howard where she goes to speak, and again, all of this happened. And I, she gives a, a young girl uh, one of her, her mink coats. And so those little things, those are nuggets that I would find here and there in my research. And so I would just include them in the story. So speaking of your research and the whole writing process, as a writer, I am obsessed with first sentences. Um, even as I can't even get into my writing until I figure out what the first sentence is going to be. So your first sentence, the first words from Hattie to us, the readers, if my mama could see me now. What inspired you to have those be Hattie's first words to us? So Hattie grew up very, very poor. Mm -hmm. um, she her, had 13, 12 siblings, and they were dirt poor. And so her mother, all her mother wanted for her, her mother and father were former slaves. They just wanted her to get a good job cleaning houses. Well, she was a um, entertainer, her and her siblings, and they wanted to entertain. But her mother, who could sing, who was a fantastic singer, didn't want that for her because a lot of times, you know, in the past, our, our mothers are in a box and they just want us to get a job that's going to pay, keep food on the table. But Hattie had bigger dreams and her mother would always say, OK, I'm going to get you this nickel so you can stop singing and go over there and, and wash these dishes. And so that's why I open with that, because she's at the Academy Awards and she's saying, I wish my mom could see this. So that 
I feel is a universal theme, right? Not just with African Americans, with people in general, we want to make our mothers proud, our ancestors. So is that also part of your why? Oh, absolutely. My, um, I love my mother to death, but she would always say, you need to get somewhere and sit down. You always doing the most because I was, I mean, I was that kid. They ask you in high school, what do you want to be? I said, an author, an anchor and an actress. Mm. And I remember a, um, a counselor was like, this is not kindergarten. You can't do all those things. Now I wish I could find it. Cause I would say, how you like me now? Let's search them up on social <laughs> media. <laughs> But it really is. Yeah. That, that's my motivation. And so it's not that my mother didn't believe in any of my dreams. My mother didn't want me to write a book. She didn't want me to go, go be a, um, on television because I took a pay cut the first time I was on TV. And I, I would always say, well, I'm going to, to pay my dues so I can live my dreams. And all she was worried about, well, who's going to pay your rent? And she was in a box. And so I had to believe in my dream enough until my mother could see it as well. And a lot of times we are, in, we are confined in these boxes and we, we try to do what they want us to do, but my mother couldn't see outside the box. Now, when the literary career took off, she was the main one saying, when are you going to buy your mama a car? Of course. Uh, but at the time, she wasn't feeling my dream and I had, to, I had to feel it enough for everybody. Speaking of dreams, you have this beautiful poem that's, at the beginning of the book, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, what dreams we have and how they fly like rosy clouds across the sky of wealth, of fame, of sure success, of love that comes to cheer and bless, and how they wither, how they fade, the waning wealth, the jilting jade, the fame that for a moment gleams then flies forever, dreams, ah, dreams. What made you put this, I love this piece of poetry, what made you select this to open up your novel? So that really is what Hattie was doing. She had dreams that nobody else believed in, nobody else could see. When, when she auditioned for the role of Mammy, every black actress in Hollywood wanted that role. Um, the Eleanor Roosevelt, who was first lady, even called the producer and wanted her maid to have the role of, of, of Mammy. And Hattie McDaniel left her maid job in her maid uniform and went and auditioned. Wow. And she walked in there in, in, maid, in her uniform, and they thought she was trying to do it in character. And she's like, no, I just got here from work. Wow. But she auditioned with Vivian Lee, and they, the chemistry took off, and they had the role. She did, turned around and did the same thing when she was nominated because they nominated Olivia de Havilland um, to, for Best Supporting the Actress. The studio did. The studio. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Hattie McDaniel said, no, I want to be nominated too. And he's like, there's never been a black person nominated. And she said, well, I'll be the first. And she, he, he still wouldn't do it. And Hattie McDaniel was a member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority. And she got her SARS together and the, she had them do a letter writing campaign. She got the newspapers to get, and they, so he came and nominated her and she ended up winning. And you know, it had, she sat back and said, well, I'm not gonna follow my dreams, but she was always doing that. Even including when it was time for her to move into Sugar Hill, it was always following a dream. So inspirational, such a dream chaser. Um, you know, the title of the book, the Queen of Sugar Hill. I didn't immediately catch the connection at first, um, and I've heard your explanation. I know everyone here would want to know how you picked this title. So Sugar Hill is the neighborhood that Hattie McDaniel lived in in Los Angeles. It was called the West Adams District when she first bought her mansion there. She bought it, and she paid $10,000 above asking costs. Wow. Um, she moved in. She was super excited about living there, and then not... Uh, not even a week after she'd been there, her neighbor sued because there was a law in Los Angeles called restrictive covenants, which means unless you are of European blood, you cannot sell your home to that person. So only people can buy homes are people with European blood. So her neighbor sued her and other black members, uh, 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 black uh, residents of the neighborhood. And Hattie McDaniel said, I'm not giving up my house. We're going to court. That's not something you saw in the 40s, early 40s. And they went to court, and she, um, the, the case prevailed. And it ended up being the catalyst for a Supreme Court case that wow. uh, was struck down restrictive covenants. So people don't know that you're able, black people are able to live wherever they want in the world because Hattie McDaniel fought to get restrictive covenants banned. 
What an And activist. I was like, how do we not know this? Now, see, that wasn't quiet activism. That was loud. She took them to court. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so that was pretty loud. Speaking of activism, the NAACP wasn't really in Hattie's Corner. So tell us a little, give us a little taste of that, because there's a scene in there that I was just clutching the pearls. Yes. So tell us something about that. So the NAACP was well-meaning. They wanted um, better portrayals of, of black people on on, in the movies, but they did it at the expense of Hattie McDaniel and actors like her. And so, in fact, in 1942, they invited her to the national convention. She thought she was going to be honored. And instead, while she's sitting there on, on the second or third row, they call Lena Horne to the stage. And they say, this is who we want America to see. This is the image of black people we want in the movies, not Hattie McDaniel's mammy. And so she has to sit in the audience with her head held high. And it was, it, you know, it was that type of thing that she got all the time. The, when she won the Oscar the next day, the Pittsburgh Courier did a newspaper article and they had her picture. And instead of congratulating her on the win, they had a big headline that said, Uncle Thomasina. Ooh. So she was faced with that type of thing all the time. Wow, wow. And, and for her to continue to get up continue to inspire youthful actors that were coming behind her. It's amazing how she was able to, to keep her spirits up. Um, I think Hattie's story, not the, not the Gone with the Wind story, but her, the story of her life is destined for the big screen or at least a TV series or something. What y'all think? Y'all agree with me? So, so can you tell us, any, uh, is anything happening? Can, give us some tea. She said it's not that kind of interview, but I need the tea. So I, um, it was on the Today Show they, um, as one of the recommended reads for, um, for Black History Month. And Craig Melvin, the, the Today Show host, was like, oh, that's a movie. I was like, speak it, Craig, speak it. Yes, I said it too. Um, <laughs> yes, we, we have had several bites. We ha I haven't signed anything yet, but my okay. fingers are crossed. We have several bites. Um, I'm attached as the lead. I don't know if they're going <laughs> to... I can't okay. sing, I can't, you know, I, but but I want to be in it. I might not be able to play Hattie, but I, yeah, if we're waiting to see. Um, I, I'm confident that, that it will be made. Everybody knows about Hattie's acting career, the people who know about Hattie, but I was surprised because she came up in the research for my book that she was a singer in Denver, Colorado. She was a huge singer. Tell us a little bit about that. Hattie McDaniel was the first black woman to sing on the radio. Wow. And she had um, several, they called them slides back then. So mm -hmm. she had several slides made and was very, very popular um, in Denver and, and the surrounding area. Wow. I love that. And, you know, I feel that the spirit of Hattie McDaniel is maybe in the room. Maybe she's helping us out. But you said the spirit of Hattie De McDaniel spoke to you while you were writing this book. What did she whisper in your ear? So I um, I went to, to um, California and I spent time at the research library there. And then, of course, I went to her house and I felt like she was there and she was talking to me. She was telling me, stop researching and get to writing uh, because the people need to know her story. And when I finished, um, I told my sister this. I said, Hattie, Hattie is pleased. And she said, I thought Hattie was dead. <laughs> she is, but I can tell you she's pleased. And I do, I feel like she is pleased because her story, a, a light is being shown on her yes. and people are getting a new look at her and the legend that she is, which is what she wanted all along because she really did work hard to, to give back to, to people and to open the doors for future actors. Absolutely. So speaking of future, what's next for you? What's on the horizon? So I love this genre. I'm a journalist. So what happens is I'm able to write facts, lay the foundation with facts, and then use the novelist side of me, fill it in, fill in the blanks with fiction. Mm -hmm. And so I love doing that. I love doing it with Hattie. And my next book is um, on Hazel Scott. Ooh. And it is um, called Harlem Blues. And Hazel Scott is, uh, for those that don't know, she is the biggest jazz singer ever. Yes. She was bigger than Sarah Vaughn, Billie Holiday, and she was married to Adam Clayton Powell. Yep. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't know about her. First black woman to have a TV show. And it was because she spoke out against civil rights and they deemed her a communist. Mm. And so she has all but been erased from history. 
Wow. And so I am knee deep in her story. I'm, I'm again, that's one of those I'm just lost in writing about her. I love her story. So that's the book I'm working on now. All right. And you get to go do some fun research on that one in Harlem, right? Yes, I'll spend some time in Harlem because one of the biggest things I discovered in writing this is that the majority of the stuff on the Internet is wrong. Mm hmm. I would um, I do some research and then, um, for example, there's if you go to Wikipedia, you go anywhere, you will see Hattie McDaniel's husband, George Langford, who died in a gambling accident. Long story short, Hattie McDaniel didn't have a husband named George Langford. And that is something that someone wrote and then someone else rewrote it, but it's all over the internet. And I was discovering things like that all the time. So I went and I went to the research library. Um, I found a husband that is not mentioned anywhere um, on the census record. And he was not mentioned because he already had a wife when he married Hattie McDaniel. Mm -mm. She knew that, um, but she kept that one under wraps. But it was on, I'm in a census record like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, so I'm discovering all of this. And, it, you know, it was just a joy to be able to lose myself in the research like that. Lose yourself in the research. That is an amazing thing because we've been doing this writing for so many years and to still have that feeling of being lost in it. That's an amazing thing. Give us, any aspiring writers in the room, anybody? Give us some tips for a new writer, someone who is just starting on this journey. What would you tell them? What would Hattie say? <laughs> just do it. You know, if I, the number of people that will come up to me and say, you know, I need to have Oprah make my book into a movie and I need to, you know, what do I need to do to land on the bestsellers list? And I'll say, well, what your book is about? Oh, I hadn't written it yet, you know. <laughs> and so th that's the, the half the journey. Just do it. Um, and one of the ways that you can make that happen is you have to set goals. Your desire to write has to become greater than your resistance to writing. And, um, you know, that's one of the things life will always get in the way. So I always tell people just write. For me, when I started, it was three pages a day, five days a week, no matter what. Once I set that small goal, I was able to achieve the bigger goals. And, and we've both done this with husbands, children that we were raising, full-time jobs. And so you're so right. The book, the writing has to come first. You, you got to write the book. You can't <laughs> get the movie from Oprah until you write the book, right? So everybody, if you don't already have this book, you need to get this book um, and get it signed tonight by Rashonda because this book is an amazing book. I have so enjoyed reading it. It's I want to say it might be my favorite Rashonda Tate novel <laughs> so far, and I've read all of them. So everybody needs to get this book. Um, and then when you get it and you read it, leave a review, tell one person, um, because that's really how we get the word out about these books. Where can everybody follow you online? My, uh, my name, RashondaTate.com, and that has links to all my, my social media. Okay, so RashondaTate.com, and, and follow her on social media. She's very entertaining <laughs> on the social, <laughs> the social media. So we, we are leaving some time for questions. Who has the first question? And they're going to give you a mic. This all the way is the hard part. I know I didn't come all the way from Houston and nobody has a question. She came up here in the cold for us. <laughs> Good. I'll talk. I'm a Sagittarius, so, you know, what's up? Um, thank you. Do I stand? Yeah, I stand. Yeah, okay, formal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, ladies. So nice to see a room full of women coming together to support someone. Thank you, Rashonda. Thank you for Tiffany. Um, we actually drove two and a half hours away um, to come here, um, and it is Angela's 30th birthday. Happy birthday! Yay. I told her, welcome to womanhood. This will be the best and worst year of yes. your life, but uh, you'll figure it out. Um, so yeah, it's her birthday, and she's an author. She's a local art author where we live. She's actually a poet, and she wrote a book. Well, she should be talking about herself. Clearly, I do marketing, and that's my thing. Um, but she wrote a book about her healing journey, um, when I met her, she shared different pieces about her life and her journey um, that have been very wrapped around trauma and deeply wounded things. And I'm like, you have to share this. You have to give this to people because it's the blueprint for someone else. And um, 
I helped encourage her with that, and we went viral on TikTok and things like that. But the reason that I wanted to come here and also come to this beautiful bookstore, um, we don't know you, we know you now, and I'm a follow and do the things and the stuff. Um, but I wanted her to be able to be in the presence of women who have been accomplished, who have also experienced trauma along their journey, I'm sure, who have also experienced hardship and things where life could have said, no, don't do it. I love that you shared the piece about your mom because that's, that's the thing. And we're even kind of conditioned and we live a life that um, eventually if you want to go a different way, it can be rough because, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My question is, can you share with us some of those hardships that you had to overcome when diving into someone else's story and having to pull yourself out of being too lost in their story? What does that look like? What does that process look like? Yeah, you know, you. Uh, definitely. Number one, tell us the name of the book. You got to always start with that. It's called Until I Heal. Until I Heal. It's, okay. It's on, it's on Amazon. All right. We'll definitely check it out. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the things that we, we always do in this journey is I'm authentic. And so I write authentic. And I think that's what people enjoy. Um, when I first started on my previous um, books, uh, people would classify them as Christian fiction. I didn't like the label because I'm a Christian who writes fiction, uh, but I didn't write Christian fiction. And I didn't like the label because I write reality, and in the real world, the crackheads I know don't say, well, pass the pipe, gosh darn it, you know? Right. And so I write the good, the bad, and the ugly, and that, that's what resonates with people. So I just urge you continue to be authentic, um, and that's where you connect with people by doing that. And I think that's how you have longevity in this career. We used to call Christian fiction, Christian friction, friction. <laughs> because of exactly what she said. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry it was a little late. Okay. But I, I have, I don't, don't, you know, hate on me. I have the audio version. I heard you on Karen Hunter's show, mm -hmm. and I was very intrigued about the story. And the audio version is excellent. I started today. I'm on Chapter 9, mm -hmm. even at work, list to it. But my question is, I was really interested in about Clark Gable and their relationship and that whole thing, as you mentioned, young lady, about that old Hollywood thing. Um, can you kind of give a little bit more? Clark Gable seemed to be kind of a civil rights. He, he Hattie McDaniel credited him for a lot of her success. Can you kind of talk a little bit about his role with her? Yeah, so Clark Gable, I was surprised to learn this. They were very dear friends. He was one of her closest friends. Uh, and in fact, when they had the Atlanta premiere of Gone with the Wind, Hattie McDaniel was not invited. And Atlanta did a huge, they had over a million people turn out for the premiere of Gone with the Wind there. And Atlanta said absolutely not to Hattie McDaniel. They removed her picture from all the promo materials. And so Clark Gable said, well, I'm not going. And it was Hattie that had to convince him and say, you need to go. You're the star of this. You're the king of Hollywood. I, I appreciate it, but go. And so he was always doing that type of thing and standing up for her. Um, he uh, was the reason they integrated the bathrooms on the set of Gone with the Wind. And so um, I really did enjoy seeing their friendship, and I wanted that to be a good part of their story. Now, I have had people ask me, well, I heard Clark Gable was black. Well, I heard that too, but I couldn't validate that. And Clark Gable has some following um, that I'm not about to touch the king of Hollywood talking about he black unless I had some solid proof. So I did not, I left that alone, but I did find a little way to weave the question in because it is a, way, a question that people are often asked. But I was like, no, we, we, we need them to buy the book and I'm not about, they will burn the book. I'll be on the banned book list. Yes. <laughs> The band book list, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, first off, I did not come from Florida to see you. I was already here, <laughs> but it is good to see you again. Yes. My daughter, Alicia, lives in DC, so okay, that's why I knew you were going to be here. Anyway, why you picked? Why did you pick um, her? Because I mean, I really like Mammy, because people are like, well, why you like Mammy? Mammy had skills. She made scarlet a dress from the damn curtains. She killed the curtain. Mammy had skills, I'm just saying. 
And that's what I want to get across. But see, we're so conditioned. We're not looking at all of that. We're not looking at the fact that Mammy was running that household. Yeah, she was. Yeah. <laughs> see, that was, that was my grandmother down there yelling at the TV. And I, all I could see was Hattie McDaniel acting, you know, she's, she's loud. And, but Hattie's had this problem. She would always say, why? I'm a comedian. I'm a comedic actor. Why can't I just do my job? Nobody looks at Lucille Ball when she acts silly and makes her an indictment of the whole white race. Why do we do that to our black actors? And that was her thing. I just want to act. I'm a, I do comedy, and this is how I do comedy. And so once I took off that lens, I was able to say, okay, Hattie down there running those people, and she's supposed to be a slave maid. So, yeah. Yeah. So I have a whole new appreciation for, for the movie. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I have a comment and then a question. Um, one, I want to share with you that Mammy was not totally uh, a repulsive name for women of color who understood uh, their roles and were strong in who they were. So I had a great aunt who uh, at, died at 104, and we kids, uh, she was born in the late uh, 1800s, and we kids called her Mammy because she understood that it's not how other people define you, it's how you define your help, yourself. I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, so I come out of uh, mammy country, shall we say. <laughs> um, so that's the comment. Uh, the question is, how do you choose the, the subjects of your, your books? In the case of Hattie McDaniel, uh, uh, how did you decide that she was somebody who, you wanted to write about and you wanted to bring to? It has to be somebody that I feel a connection to. And I felt a connection to Hattie McDaniel. I feel a connection to Hazel Scott. There was another lady uh, 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 that I wanted to write about. Her name was Mammy Pleasant. And she was one of the richest women back in the, the late 1800s who ended up losing everything because she had to, because she did real estate, she was a maid. But what she would do is she would go to all the, um, the rich white bankers conferences and she would listen as she's serving their tea and cleaning up. And she would listen and then she would take their advice and go invest her money. And so she was fascinating to me. I felt a connection to her, especially because she lost everything and died penniless because she got a white man to be the face of her business because that's what she had to do during that time. And he ended up dying and his white wife took everything because everything was in her, in her name, in his name. And so her story fascinated me. So, and that's what I, I look for is something that I have a connection to. People often ask me if Patty McDaniel had any children and she did not. She desperately wanted children. In fact, she, um, there was a point where she thought that she was pregnant, and that was one of the most saddest parts of her life. Um, it turned out to be a false pregnancy, and so she, um, she had no children. She does have a great-great-grandnephew who is still alive, and that's really the only legacy that she has now. Did you talk to that? family member while you were writing the book? No, and so I was. I had planned to talk to a distant, distant relative, and a friend of mine said, do not do that because you're writing fiction. And so think about if, if somebody came and said, I'm writing a story about your mother, but I'm going to make up this part. Then they're, gonna, they're like, oh, no, don't make up nothing about my mama. <laughs> and so that's why you right. really want to stay away from the family. And I had all but planned to meet with this woman. And then um, I, I was advised not to, so I didn't. And then I later found out that she met with somebody else and then ended up suing them who wrote a nonfiction book. Okay. So I was like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm just going to stay away from the family. And so how do authors protect themselves against that kind of thing? Because, you know, I'm writing historical fiction, too, so I need to know. Yeah, so if, if, you, if the person is a public figure, anybody can write a story about you. Okay. All right. Now, do you want to be tied up with, with liable cases and all of that? No. Yeah. So you still have to make sure that everything you're putting in that, that, could, that could be controversial is foundations based in facts. Gotcha, gotcha.
Rashonda, your book tour and just seeing all of the hoopla that's going on for um, your book has been amazing to me and, and I am so happy to see that. You've had mixed audiences on this side of the table. How are women of different hue um, receiving the Hattie McDaniel story? Oh, I, I mean, it's amazing to me. I did um, a, an event in Winston-Salem, and it, it probably had to be 100 old, um, elderly white women and men there. And when I tell you we had the best time, they loved it. They Now, I did have one 90-something-year-old woman came and told me, and, and she's whispering. She said, I, after they came, they banned it, I started feeling guilty about it. And I'm first, I'm like, why are you whispering? But okay. <laughs> But she felt guilty, and she said the book made her shed the guilt about liking Mammy. And it was just because she, she considered herself an ally. But she's like, okay, if they're all mad about it, then I guess I should be mad, but I really do like Mammy. And so I, that's what I want. I want to open a dialogue. I want us to not be so quick to cancel had the cancel cult culture. And I want them to also be able to understand. I'm in this group, this Gone with the Wind Facebook group. And I, um, I did not, I, I, I just, I've been there since October and I finally decided to talk about Hattie in this group. And the group has about 40,000 members. And I was dumbfounded that my post went viral with them. And there were people that came and that were, you know, these are longtime lovers of Gone with the Wind. And one man said that there, right now it's, it's about 37,000 likes. It's been shared about 8,000 times. And um, it has about 6,000 comments. And one man came and he was like, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard. How do you not like Hattie, uh, Mammy? She was great and great. And so I came uh, back on and I approached him, you know, and said, you don't understand where I'm coming from. As a young woman of color, I wanted to see something different. But once I took off my lens, I was able to appreciate Mammy. And he, all he could do when he came back and said, okay, I'm going to order your book. And he ordered the book. And he started talking about it in the group and they're person after person after person because they're not around us. And so they didn't have anyone. They're just like, Mammy is Mammy. Why are you mad? But to have someone there explain why so many people had disdain for it opened their eyes as well. And these stories are universal, right? They're American stories, you know? So absolutely keep sharing and, and telling folks, she's so nice on social media. I have a lot to learn. I am watching my big sister <laughs> and how she responds to some of the trolls. And she does such a great job. She's way better than me. Yeah, when, when he responded, she was like, cuss them out. I'm like, no. I did. I did. <laughs> no, we're not going to cuss them out. I'm like, Hattie, I'm a quiet change agent. Yes, she is. I'm not. <laughs> um, fo Follow-up question. Why is this so hard to find your book? I'm tired of going to these bookstores and not being able to buy a copy, Amazon, taking two weeks to get it to me. Um, and then at the Barnes & Noble in Bowie, where I was trying to buy more than one copy to give to friends, um, they said, well, we have to order them. Well, when will it be in? Uh, we don't know. We can't tell you. So what is happening with that? Did they not anticipate how big this was going to be? And what, what is the time code on that in the video so I can send that to my publisher? <laughs> yeah, um, it, they, they did not, they, well, one, you know, my publisher, I feel, and I'm grateful to William Moore. I think they're great. I'm so happy they published this story. I think they underestimated it. Uh, I think they underestimated the desire of people to know more about it. They are scrambling now to get it into those stores. It has been the most frustrating thing ever because people are ordering. And when Amazon is on back, oh, we're in another bookstore. We're not supposed to be talking about Amazon. But when stores are on back order with the book, it's frustrating. And they've tried to really work it out. And they say, okay, we're going to set these books aside for your book signing. And those books are gone. Um, I, I had someone email me in, in Houston because my neighborhood Barnes and Noble, they had 40 that were gone and they said, well, we don't know when we get some more in. I'm like, you need to be placing some expedited orders. But it was a matter of, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that they thought would do well. And then it was on a Today Show and then people are, and the media coverage is through the roof. So they're scrambling and they're really trying to work to get it all, all out now.
There are lots of copies available at the back of Politics and Prose, <laughs> the Union Market location. <laughs> and, and we'll have signed copies, so yes. tell your friends. Yes. And, and that's one of the things, you know, the, there's only so much room in a bookstore, as you can see. So they have to make calculated guesses on what they think something will do. And so I can't be completely mad at them. All I can do is get out there and show you. Um, I, I'm showing them a lot. Uh, they initially are like, well, we don't really want to do a book tour because nobody comes out to book tours anymore. And so every night I send them pictures from my book tour and they're like, wow. Right. So, yeah, it's just you got to show them. I live in Tampa. Do you think a lot of that is based on demographics? I live in, I'm from Florida, which is what you are right now. I met you in Tampa. I live in Tampa. I could not find this book anywhere. And I'm thinking, I'm not ordering this over Amazon. Uh, when I get to D.C., because 9,000 black folk live here, maybe I'll find it when I get here. But I, I, do you think it's demographics? I think it's a combination of all of that. Um, because, you know, like I said, the, my neighborhood bookstores, the independent bookstores had it. Well, yeah, but the independent, but, but my neighborhood bookstores, the, the big chains didn't have it. The independent bookstores did. And so that's where I've been pushing people to the independent bookstores. But that's because they have a better pulse on what people want. Exactly. The big exactly. chains do not. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Black English just opened a couple about a month or so ago. So are you coming to Florida again? She done put me, what, what's the time code on that one too so I can tell my, uh, tell my publisher? I know, right? I, I will go wherever. My, my publisher is like, we're, well, we're going to um, do some blog stuff. I'm like, okay, well, let me send you my tour schedule, where I'm going and what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's and and the only reason I'm I'm on Facebook I'm now Facebook shut me down because I invite everybody I'm like hi I'll, I'll be in your town Facebook like stop emailing people they I guess they thought I was spamming folks but I really do, I have to show them because they don't believe it until you show them and they they believe it now and I think one of the ways that we it's a missed opportunity is when you see the authors that you love and they're promoting their books and they're asking you to pre-order, do that. Because those pre-order numbers are telling the chains, the stores, this book is in demand and people are gonna wanna read this. And so it's not just a, you know, an ask, it's just random. It is, when we ask for pre-orders, it's because we really want to give that demand signal to the booksellers and to our publishers yeah. even, that this book is it's gonna do more than your expectations, so. The books, yes. That is something that I learned very recently. So one way, you know, we always will say, you know, we'll get the ebook from um, Barnes & Noble or we'll, you know, get the audio book. The paperback books, when you pre-order those, that is what really, really, or in hardcover, whichever, the print books is what really gives that demand signal that, hey, this is going to be a big deal and we need to get, get on the train before it leaves the station. Because... Rashonda's train left the station. It's all it's chugging along. So yeah. we are just they're trying to catch up right now. Yeah, I send them on a regular basis. I, I send them, well, here's what I'm doing now. And you know, here's where what TV show I'm on now. Here's I'm on Fox Soul, watch me and they're just like, okay, how'd you get all this? Because I'm not sitting at the train station waiting on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I think this has been a great discussion, and I'm so happy I was able to do it. I was able to stand in for Victoria Christopher Murray. Thank you, Victoria, um, for you know asking me to do this. I'm excited for you. I'm happy for you. You're my big sister in this literary industry, and I really appreciate everything that's happening for you. And y'all, get the book. I think she's, you're about to sign, right? Yes, I'm going to sign. But I want to recognize I have some sorority sisters oh. here. So would the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha please stand? My chapter sorors, my special. Thank you, ladies, for coming. One Hattie sorors is here. Yes, too. and we, we have to have our Sigma Gamma Rho. Oh, you, you have something? OK. Yeah. <laughs>
And, and you'll be, it'll be interesting for you to see in the book. Um, it, it, I do. I make sure. And let's recognize the Sigma Gamma Rho because Hattie is a, po a very proud member of Sigma Gamma Rho sorority. Is, yes. And so one of the things that um, I do, I make sure that that's included in the book. So her, um, it's a big part of the book. But because I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha, I do have to have her meet Ethel Hedgeman, Ethel Hedgeman Lyle as well. That's our founder. <laughs> So uh, I had a ball writing it, and, and you'll see some other characters in there as well. And my family is here. Hello. Hi, family. Yes. All right, and I am here to sign books. And thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate you. In the audience with her head held high. And it was, it, you know, it was that type of thing that she got all the 